Penny and on Zoom. Got it. Welcome to this week's Bloomington Rotary Club weekly celebration of service. I'm your president, Sally Gaskill. Thank you all for being here. Um, it's pumpkin season as evidenced by the pumpkin dessert here in the Frangipani. I hope you all enjoy however long pumpkin season lasts. The vision of our club is to be a diverse, engaged community of leaders and fellowship and service have a significant impact globally and locally. We are one of over 33,000 Rotary Clubs in more than 200 countries, so truly a global organization. And this week, thanks to Natalie Blaze, we have the banner for this, week, this year's theme. Shekhar Mehta from India is the current president of Rotary International, and our theme is Serve to Change Lives. To start our meeting today, let's please observe a moment of silence. Thank you and please be seated. I'd like to introduce co-program committee chair, Connie Shikalis on Zoom. Connie's going to give us the reflection today. Thank you, President Sally. Get yourself a latte mocha, then a mook. How many know what I mean? Raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about. MOOC. Every day, I briefly assess what went right, wrong, or neutral that day. One thing that has worked well for me is MOOCs, massive open online courses. Many of them are free. Certain platforms charge a small fee if you want a verified certificate of completion, and some universities offer course credit. MOOCs often enroll hundreds or thousands of learners simultaneously. And to accomplish that, enrollment is usually open year round or in a designated period. And they are self-paced and completely online, which is a double bonus because you improve your computer skills as you go. Many institutions, including Harvard and MIT, deliver these online courses on a variety of subjects and at different educational levels. You can take a single class or a sequence. So far, I've taken an art course through the Yale University Art Gallery and a social media marketing class through Northwestern University. Both of mine I found on a platform called Coursera, Coursera. But there are many ways to access a MOOC. The term was coined in 2008 by Dave Cormier at the University of Prince Edward Island and Brian Alexander of the National Institute for Technology and Liberal Education. MOOCs started slowly, but really took off about 10 years ago. Here are four of the many MOOCs just waiting for you. Fundamentals of Particle Accelerator Technology, Negotiation, that's at Yale, Global Diplomacy, Korean, and just about any other language. Happy MOOCing. Thank you, Connie. We have quite a few guests here today, and I would like to ask those who are here in the Frangipani to please stand up when I read your name so that we can recognize you. First, we have a guest of our OMIC, Ava Taylor, an IU student. Two guests from Brown County, are Brown County Rotary Club, are Mike Heil and Clara Stanley. Welcome. <laughs> Lisa Fukuda is a name that we should be familiar with, a guest of Jim Bright. Lisa is, of course, the wife of our former incoming Rotary Global Scholar, who's Fukuda, and Lisa works at the university's um, uh, president for vice president for the Office of Research. Lydia Minton is a guest of Jim Bright. 
and a member of Rotaract. And I understand that, that Lydia worked with Lynn Schwartzberg at Lotus on Friday night. Congrats. And thanks to all of our Lotus volunteers. Um, and finally, John Taylor is a guest of Hank Walter. He's an association CEO. A couple of guests also on Zoom. Nancy Berner is a guest of Judy Schroeder. Mike Leros from Brown County Rotary, and David Willett from the Plymouth, Michigan Rotary. Thank you all for being here. Thanks to our producer, Michael Shermas, who keeps my head in the correct place on the Zoom. Uh, also to our Zoom manager, Joy Harder, and today's roundabout reporter also on Zoom is Susie Graham. Um, I want to thank Tim Jessen for stepping up and agreeing to manage the four-way test speech contest for our club. Go, Tim. And I only had to ask once. That's what's really remarkable about this. Way to go, Rotarians. We have several birthdays this week. Von Welch's birthday is September 30th, and Becky Jessmer is October 1st. And member anniversaries, we have Von Welch also, two years in our club, Art Omic, our greeter. Sorry, I forgot to thank you, Art, for greeting for us today. You may become our, our permanent greeter if you're not careful. Um, seven years in our club, thank you, Art. And finally, Rex Hillary has been a member for 10 years. We're gonna do happy dollars and Happy Dollars Benefit Teachers Warehouse. You can either give cash if you're here in the Frangie Panty, or you can uh, give online if you're on Zoom, or you can mix it up. Um, I'd like to start with Mike Leros from Brown County Rotary, who has some Happy Dollars to start. Well, thank you very much, Sally. I appreciate it. And I appreciate Jim Wright, Wright also for the invitation as well. Um, this is a promotional plug for Brown County's uh, Taste of Art, which is a our fundraiser uh, held by our charitable arm of our organization uh, that is used to fund the uh, youth development and other youth related activities in Brown County, as well as other needed projects like Mother's Cupboard. So 100% of the proceeds from our fundraiser are used for uh, and, uh, nonprofit issues not related to uh, operations of the club. Um, the Taste of Art is uh, uh, an auction of original and heritage paintings, mostly of Brown County origin. Uh, most of the contemporary artists are very well known and well respected in the area. It is. Um, uh, it includes artists that some of you may be familiar with, like Ken Bucklew, uh, Pam Newell. Chris Newland, uh, Sarah Strock Wasson, who just won Best of Art at the uh, Indiana Heritage Arts, which I'm also on the board of there, and, and many other. We have about 25 different artists, about 50 original paintings, also heritage art by uh, L.O. Griffith, uh, Gustav Bauman, uh, photos, original photos by uh, Frank uh, Hohenberger. So if you're at all familiar with uh, contemporary and heritage art from the Brown County area, uh, we have a very good selection. The artists are very generous. They know it's a fundraiser. They set minimum bid prices that are well below what they typically would get in the gallery. Um, I don't, I can't advertise that because I don't want to be hurting their brands, but there are bargains we have, but there's also just beautiful and uh, wonderful original works. The program is uh, on uh, October 15th, Friday, October 15th, starts at six o'clock, ends at uh, about 8.30 or so. There is a silent auction as well that includes uh, limited edition prints and other nice items, just a little bit smaller. Uh, the program is um, uh, professionally auctioneered by Dennis Jackson, who's done a marvelous job for us over the last five years. Uh, very good uh, auctioneer. It's a fun time. It's usually a little more fun because we have the taste part of Taste of Art, which this year with COVID we decided to do without, but we do have an open cash bar because we like to see people get a little lubricated before the bidding starts. So 
Anyway, Taste of Art being held at the uh, Seasons Inn in uh, Nashville, Indiana on October 15th. Uh, Clara and Mike Heil are there. Clara has some posters to kind of pass around. Uh, and so we hope some of you are able to join us. And I can tell you, I'm looking forward to two things. The talk today uh, by Professor Kate and also uh, your own fundraiser in November with the uh, uh, post tasting or toasting. Mm -hmm. So we're looking forward very much. Hope to see some of you join us in Brown County one of these days. I am co-president of the club this year. So thank you for your time. Mike, thank you. And good luck with your fundraiser. Um, and thanks for the plug for our own Rotary Toast on November the 5th. Happy dollars, other happy dollars. Anyone out there? Okay. We've got Aaron approaching Katie. Hi, everybody. Um, so I have $5 on behalf of myself and my husband, Dougie, who I want to know. Uh, I'm happy because Dougie and his family are back to play this festival this weekend, and it went really, really well. It was really fun. And I'm happy for myself because I found out how to do it. I have to be in a bar again. Congrats, Katie. Lynn Schwartzberg. I have two happy dollars. I'm happy that we survived Lotus, which is an awesome volunteer, and that my job site is getting better staffed, and we are surviving the hot spot here in the Excellent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Next, Art Omic. <laughs> Art's just happy to give to Teachers Warehouse. We like that. Anybody else here in the room or on Zoom? One more. No? Yes. Clara. I'm, um, I'm very happy that I um, might here from Brown County, uh, I really uh, brag about this from Bloomington Rotary, and you really better bring your wife together. It's like a high end couple. <laughs> you know, I'm very happy that um, Governor Mike introduced Cindy. You know that he's the former DC governor, and he's a really like mentor of a South Fork International Rotary Club. And then I went to Chin uh, Community Center because of his presentation. And then and the main is here for the president is she really wanted to reach out to Chin students in IU. So we really made a connection happen. So I'm so happy it's gonna happen something that so also really happy that Chin is so supportive of me. So that's my happy thoughts. Thank you, Clara. <laughs> And with that, I would like to ask Judy Schroeder to come to the podium and introduce today's speaker. Lots of people who have gathered both on Zoom and here in person. And it's generally not a coincidence when we have an interesting speaker on tap. We have a really good turnout, which is shows me that I'm not the only one. When I asked Beth to speak, I told her that I was a Beth Kate groupie. Anytime that Beth speaks, I go to hear her. She is a professor of law and public affairs and is the faculty coordinator for a major and minor in law and public policy within the IU School of Public and Environmental Affairs. Her teaching service and scholarly interests focus on legal and policy issues involving intellectual property, data and information technologies, constitutional law, and the intersection of law and religion. Publications include a co-authored chapter on the Supreme Court and information privacy. Beth served as Associate General Counsel at IU, focusing primarily on intellectual property, research administration, and data and IT regulations and governance. Before joining the university, Beth served as in-house counsel for Eli Lilly, 
clerk for the Honorable S.J. Plager of the United States Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit and practiced with a Washington, D.C. law firm. She has served on the National Association of College and University Attorneys Board of Directors. Beth was recently appointed by the mayor of Bloomington to a five-year term on the town's planning commission. She is a brave woman. Now, this is the sentence that she wrote, and I think it's just so wonderful. I'm going to read it just the way it, it appears on her official thing that she sent me. She is a long-serving member of the Board of Trustees of the Indianapolis Zoo and spends her weekends caring for the zoo's African elephants, honing shoveling skills that she has found of considerable use within the university. Come on, Deb. Come on, Deb. Oh, I love this. Fantastic. This is, is it really? Oh, okay. <laughs> well, in that case. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, Judy. Uh, thank you all for inviting me. Thanks to everyone who is online. Uh, I'm looking forward to this conversation and have been since Judy called. Um, I have the greatest respect for Rotary uh, and always enjoy interacting with it and its members. Um, so you want to talk about the Supreme Court. Well, I'm always happy to talk about the Supreme Court. Uh, before I do, let me just say I am also glad it's pumpkin season. But I actually just saw an advertisement for pumpkin spice ramen noodles, and even my undergraduates would not eat that. So I think we've gone a step too far. Okay. But uh, with that said, let's talk about the Supreme Court. So I'm a very informal person, as uh, there are many people, I think, in the audience who know me, and for those who don't, uh, please feel free to interrupt if uh, you can't hear me or more importantly with questions or would like to uh, get some clarification on something. And of course there will be time for Q and A as well. And I look forward to your questions. What I want to talk about are essentially three things uh, in my remarks to start. One is some major cases coming up this term. Another is the issue of the Supreme Court's shadow docket, which some of you may have been reading about. And then finally, uh, some reform proposals, which are currently under study by a presidential commission that you also may have read about. So with that, um, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, there are many cases on the Supreme Court's docket uh, for the term coming up, but the ones I'm going to focus on uh, in my remarks are the ones that I suspect most people want to talk about, and that is the abortion cases, the gun case, and uh, whether you wanna talk about this one or not, uh, a religion case. Uh, and the reason why I chose those is not only because they all present some significant constitutional issues that the court will be grappling with, but because they all deal with, I think, and will deal with issues of the standards that the court will articulate in the respective areas they're dealing in that will have impact going forward on other cases and in just that area of law. So with that, let's talk about the new term. So the new term starts on Monday, the first Monday in October, and they are going back to in-person oral arguments. But uh, as you probably know, they have been uh, working virtually as all of us have been. <laughs> Uh, to some extent during the pandemic, but they will be going back to in-person oral arguments, although the public will not be there in the court. However, we can still listen to live audio streams uh, as they were doing during all of their virtual work. So if you are a Supreme Court junkie, don't worry, you can listen to them uh, literally live. Um, okay, uh, in terms of the key cases, let's start with abortion. Uh, there are two cases on the court's docket that are worth mentioning here, and then there is also the uh, court's recent activity with respect to the Texas state abortion law, which I can also comment on briefly. But the major case 
uh, before the court this term on abortion is Dobbs, and it comes out of Mississippi. It poses the question of whether or not effectively a state ban on abortions uh, after about 15 weeks, really about 13 weeks uh, under the state law, um, whether that violates uh, current law uh, that the Supreme Court has enunciated. The standard for whether a state law regulating abortion right now is whether that law imposes an undue burden on access to abortion before viability of the fetus. Viability medically is pegged at about uh, 20, between 22 and 24 weeks, depending on who you ask. So 15 weeks or 13 weeks, uh, depending on how you calculate from the state law, is certainly earlier than that. And what the, uh, what the state um, has done is enact a law with the understanding, I think, that it was going to go up uh, on a challenge. And if it got to the Supreme Court, if the court took it, uh, it will pose directly the question of what standard the court will continue to use going forward. Uh, and of course, everyone's watching to see, will the court actually eliminate the constitutional right to access uh, for abortion? Um, I uh, think that is unlikely. I don't think that the court is poised to overturn Roe versus Wade, but I suspect it could very well um, cut back on access to abortion by uh, holding that state laws that regulate access pre-viability in this way and even curtail the period of time for access to abortion pre-viability are consistent with an undue burden standard. So let me just briefly explain what I mean by that. There's been a debate among the justices over the last couple of major cases on abortion about what it means to impose an undue burden on access to abortion. That is, does it mean that the state's law has to be sufficiently justified in terms of the rationale the state offers? Uh, in other words, if the state says, hey, we're regulating because we think there's a, a challenge to women's health here, and we need to address that uh, through this regulation, um, then uh, does the state have to come forward and actually demonstrate that there is that problem uh, with a uh, challenge to women's health and that this regulation is going to help fix that. Uh, and if it turns out that the regulation really isn't about health, but it may simply be because the state wants to favor uh, carrying to term and oppose abortion, then does that somehow undermine the uh, constitutionality of the law? Does that make the burden it imposes undue? That's one theory. Another theory, uh, which I suspect will have a majority of votes on the court, is that an undue burden means it's just too difficult to get an abortion. And if that is the test, regardless, in other words, that test would say we take the states at their word, okay? And, and current constitutional law allows the state legislature to simply prefer to have women carry to term. They can express that preference as long as they don't make it too difficult to get access to an abortion pre-viability. And so the big question going into the Dobbs case will be, what will the court do in evaluating these various uh, restrictions that um, are not really pegged at uh, the current understanding of viability Will they say it's, it's still too hard to get an abortion or no? Even the Texas case, which is based on uh, heartbeat, fetal heartbeat, and effectively would ban uh, abortions after about six weeks. Uh, you could still determine whether you're pregnant and still get an abortion. Will the court go further down that road to say it's not an undue burden, you're just going to have to do more in order to uh, get access to abortion in a time frame uh, within which you can act. So that's what I'm kind of keeping an eye out for. I, I, I've had a number of questions from students and others about whether I think Roe versus Wade will go away uh, based on these, uh, this case. And I really don't think so, but I can't say that there's no chance. Uh, one of the things that was interesting is as I'm sure you've all observed, 
the House Democrats uh, passed a bill that would guarantee federal access to abortion for a certain time period. And uh, there has been for years now a sentiment among a number of the justices that too many issues have become issues of constitutional law for the court where they should be matters of political debate and decision making by the other branches. And, uh, and, and seeing the other branches getting involved uh, may actually prompt some of those justices, which includes, for example, the chief, uh, Justice John Roberts, to say, well, you know what? It, maybe you don't need a constitutional right to access abortion if you can actually accomplish, uh, or if there's going to be some uh, uptake, if you will, by the political branches of these issues. And some of the arguments that are being made to the Supreme Court in these cases in Friends mm -hmm. of the Court briefs are very much hitting this issue of just let us regulate. We won't wipe out abortion. We will have sensible abortion regulation that reflects uh, Americans' desire to enable early term abortion, if you look at polling data, but restricts it more and more and more as the pregnancy progresses. So. That's one abortion case. The other abortion case actually does not really pose an issue of abortion law so much, but it comes out of Kentucky uh, and uh, it involves another uh, restriction, in this case, restricting the, the procedure, uh, dilation and evacuation, which is the most common second trimester abortion method and uh, if it effectively makes it uh, sort of inaccessible after 15 weeks or very difficult and potentially dangerous to get. And uh, the issue there is whether or not the attorney general, the state's new attorney general, can intervene uh, at this stage after the appeals court had upheld striking down this law as inconsistent with current Supreme Court case law. Uh, they, the lower courts held it was an undue burden. Uh, the new attorney general um, who was elected came in and said, I want to intervene and defend this law because the uh, Democratic administration now in Kentucky was not going to push it further to the Supreme Court. He's trying to take it to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court will decide whether he can actually do that. So it doesn't really pose a direct uh, jurisprudential issue on whether there's a right to abortion or not, uh, but it's interesting to watch. Um, and then the Texas law, uh, the only thing I'm going to say about that is it's a shadow docket case. So when we get to the shadow docket, I'll say more about that. Okay, so there's uh, just in, in a nutshell, uh, the abortion cases. Let's talk about guns. Um, so back in 2008 and then in 2010, the Supreme Court issued a pair of decisions on what the Second Amendment means. And it was really the first time that the Supreme Court had weighed in on how you interpret the language of the Second Amendment uh, and the right to keep and bear arms. And in those cases, what they held effectively is that neither the federal government nor the states could ban functional firearms in the home for self-defense, that that right is encompassed within the Second Amendment. But it left open everything else, what other restrictions on access to weapons or carrying weapons or so on, uh, were going to be constitutional and what would be a violation of the Second Amendment. And the court did not, in those earlier cases, set out a standard for judging the constitutionality of further uh, gun control measures. And so the case before the Supreme Court right now, New York State Rifle and Pistol Association, uh, versus Corlett, uh, is, I suspect, going to uh, uh, require the court to articulate more what the standard's going to be. It's been about, you know, almost 12 years, if you go from the 2010 case, uh, and there have been numerous attempts to get the Supreme Court to weigh in on the constitutionality of measures that have been upheld by the lower courts. Uh, that restrict uh, access to guns or use uh, of guns in various ways. Well, use, uh, you know, we, we can regulate use, but access to carrying and so on. And, um, and some of the justices, including Justice Thomas, have written time and again, uh, dissenting from the court's decision to not take a case and uh, evaluate the constitutionality of various state restrictions. Um, he's been writing, you know, the lower courts have been ignoring 
what we said in those two earlier cases, that this is a strong right to keep and bear arms and they are simply running roughshod over this right, we need to course correct here. And when Amy Coney Barrett joined the court after Ruth Bader Ginsburg died and Justice Barrett uh, joined the court, um, one of the things back in a mini university talk, uh, I, I remember saying is one of the major impacts this will have will be taking a gun rights case um, to the court sooner rather than later, because this was an issue she had already staked out a little bit in her brief time on the Seventh Circuit before she joined the Supreme Court. And sure enough, here we are. And uh, in this case, if there's a New York law, which basically says you have to demonstrate a particularized need for self-defense in order to get an unrestricted license to conceal carry in New York. And there is a second amendment challenge to that. So what I anticipate is we're going to hear a lot in the oral argument about what the appropriate standard of review courts should use will be when they are judging whether any gun control measure is compatible with the Second Amendment. Uh, the Supreme Court has articulated what it calls levels of scrutiny. In other words, levels of justification the government has to have if it's going to interfere with liberty. And depending on how fundamental the liberty interest is, the more or less justification the government has to have to interfere with it. If you have a fundamental liberty interest in keeping and bearing arms, for example, typically the court will say the government in regulating in a way that interferes with that fundamental interest has to show its regulation is narrowly tailored to serve a compelling government interest. It's what we call strict scrutiny by the court. Okay. If the liberty interest is not that strong if you're engaging in an activity which we generally assume government's going to have the right to interfere with because you know government regulates in that area historically and all the time, then all the government has to show is that its regulation is rationally related to a legitimate government interest. And the language signals how much lower a level of justification that is for regulation. And in between is this notion of intermediate scrutiny, which would require the government to show that it has, uh, its, its regulation is substantially related to an important government interest, right? The sort of three-tiered approach. All this really means, all this language means is how much justification does the government have to have to act in a way that is limiting human activity that someone is claiming a liberty interest to engage in. And so the big debate in this case is going to be, well, how much justification will governments have to have? What is the nature of this right? And in the cases the Supreme Court decided back in 2008 and 2010, they aggressively said, we are not setting out some all in one, all encompassing standard to use. We're gonna let this percolate. We're going to let this area develop. This is the first time since the Second Amendment was written we're really jumping in here and we don't want to embarrass the future by getting it wrong. And so they've had about 13 years or so, 12, 13 years for lower court case law to percolate and for um, them to be thinking about this. And I think what we're going to see is a whole lot of engagement on what that standard will be. Um, I, I don't know about the New York law. I have to say the federal government's weighed in the Justice Department with a friend of the court brief in this case, which is pushing intermediate scrutiny. They're basically saying these rights are important rights. They are significant rights, but we would not uh, support. When we look at history, history shows us lots of regulation of access to weapons, and they literally cite regulations going back to the 13th century. So for all the originalists out there that interpret the Constitution based on the original public meaning at the time language was written, the government's brief says we got lots of regulation out there. And so this is not one of those rights that we would say the government has never been allowed to interfere with this. They've got to show the absolute highest level of justification. So I think that's where we're gonna land. Where the New York law will land uh, is another matter. I think um, it will depend a lot on uh, how much uh, this uh, requirement has been used to withhold licenses and how those data strike the court. Uh, there's been a lot of argumentation in the briefs about um, this is a way to keep guns in the hands of kind of the rich elite, 
but keep them out of the hands of the kind of uh, poor folks and uh, people who you know are kind of disfavored in society for various ways that don't involve criminality. Uh, and so uh, there's been assault on this notion of you know what does it take to justify your need for self-defense. But the um, government of the state of New York and the federal government have come back saying, no, actually a lot of people get licenses under this requirement. And there's always been this individualized assessment of whether or not someone really has a need, a good enough need based on the circumstances of their own life, where they live, the crime rate, all this kind of stuff to justify a, a, an unlimited concealed carry license. Okay, so that's what we're talking about for handguns, for hand weapons. And then finally on religion, uh, we are uh, facing the next in a series of cases involving uh, schools and um, public funding of education where the dollars will uh, eventually go to a religious or sectarian school. So the court has decided several of these over the years, and I think it's fair to say as a summary matter that the Supreme Court has staked out an understanding of the First Amendment religion clauses, which effectively says um, religion has a most favored nation status, uh, so that if any uh, regulation is treating uh, religion or religious people differently than it would comparable secular activities uh, or organizations, then that is going to violate the free exercise clause um, because it is, uh, uh, it's sort of actively targeting, if you will, religion, um, or having that impact at least. And in the school context where the Supreme Court has landed before the case that's on the docket now, uh, has been basically to say a couple of things. First, for things like school voucher programs, if you have taxpayer funded vouchers and the voucher goes to a parent and the parent chooses where they send their children, as long as presumably it's an accredited school, so the curriculum is otherwise uh, uh, you know, uh, sound according to the, um, the state, uh, then the parents' use of the dollars to send their child to a sectarian school where they will also get sectarian education does not entangle the government in religion because there's an intervening actor. Okay, and so it doesn't impose an establishment clause problem. It's not an establishment of religion, even though it's public money. Right? So that's one thing. And then in uh, the last few years, the court has uh, decided a couple of cases, one last term and one a couple of years before that to uh, a few years before that, um, where they said, if you have um, public funding and you are denying it to organizations, including schools, because of their religious status, but they otherwise meet all of the secular criteria for access to that funding, that's a violation of the Establishment Clause. And uh, in this case, the case before the court right now, um, the main constitution basically guarantees a right to uh, free public education through secondary school. But the problem in Maine is they don't have enough public secondary schools. And so what they do, they're broken up into school districts and they say, look, if you don't have this kind of school in your school district, you can send your students, your pupils to another district or we will pay for the parents to send them to a private accredited school as long as it is non-sectarian under the First Amendment or in accordance with the First Amendment. And so parents who want to send their children to religious schools, which are otherwise accredited, are now challenging this under the Supreme Court's most recent cases. Um, and the, the, uh, the issue, when I said before, all these cases kind of involve a standard, the Supreme Court uh, in the recent cases has said, well, you know, you can't discriminate based on status. But that doesn't mean that the government can't withhold funding maybe if the money is gonna be put toward a religious use. And this case is going to, I think, push the court to decide whether that's a line that can actually uh, be maintained. There are justices, including Justice Gorsuch, who says, I don't really know what that means. You know, What's the difference between money going to a sectarian school or not going because you say, well, it's controlled by a church. 
your concern ultimately is that that money is somehow going to subsidize religious education, that it will, money's fungible and it will go toward religious education. And, um, and so the use status distinction just doesn't make any sense, uh, according to him, and he has some other justices in that camp. So I think uh, this is um, what the court is going to be grappling with now. There's a, a lingering concern about something that feels like public taxpayer dollars going directly for, for uh, sectarian religious education. But um, at the same time, I think if you look at the direction the court's been going and the fact that even under this main program, it's the parent who's choosing the school. I think there's no question but that the court took this case to strike down the main, the main limits, uh, the funding going to a sectarian school. And I think that that uh, regulation is about to get struck down. So um, that's the docket in a nutshell, or at least those are some of the big cases in the docket. There are lots of other cases, which by the way, would be of great interest. I suspect to Rotor remembers, and I'm happy to try and talk about those two in questions. Okay, the shadow docket. Just very briefly, the when a case comes to the Supreme Court generally, there is a lot of briefing by the parties, first to persuade the court to take the case since most of the court's cases are voluntary, they don't have to take them. And then once they decide to take a case, not only the parties, but all these friends of the court weigh in, tons of briefing, tons of analysis. Usually a case has come up through the lower courts where the lower court uh, opinions deal with the issues fully. Then we have oral argument. And then the court issues a, a decision with opinions for the majority. There might be concurring opinions, dissenting opinions, lots of analysis, lots of thorough analysis, right? That's the usual merit docket when a matter comes before the Supreme Court. The shadow docket, which is otherwise called the orders list, is there for the court to receive requests for emergency relief from something that a lower court has done. So if a, a district court, that's the trial level, first entry level court in the federal system, or a court of appeals has issued an order and one of the parties really disagrees with it and they go to the Supreme Court and they ask the court to temporarily stay the application of what the court below did while they continue to fight whether what the lower court did was right on the law or not. We've seen a huge surge in people knocking on the Supreme Court's door for this type of temporary relief. Over the last four years, okay, there's been just an enormous uptick in this. And in fact, I had some, hang on, let me see if I can find my statistics, which I've not committed to memory. Um, but uh, yes, uh, last four years, uh, filings at 20 times the rate of the last 16 years. Uh, for shadow docket requests. And that term shadow docket was actually coined by uh, the son of Pat Bode, who uh, is sadly no longer with us, but was on the Maurer School of Law faculty for many, many years. His son Will is at Chicago. And Will coined that term. And Will has raised some uh, serious concerns with this, as have many others, uh, because what's been going on is the Supreme Court has been uh, deciding cases um, on this uh, sort of request for emergency relief that even though they're temporary orders in nature really have an impact uh, because uh, they set a status quo that may not actually be able in real life to change on the ground, okay? And there are lots of examples of this. I'm happy to talk about examples, but suffice it to say that this has gotten Congress's attention as well. The House Judiciary Committee held a hearing back in February. The Senate Judiciary Committee is about to hold a hearing uh, on this as well uh, coming up. And there have been concerns raised about whether what's going on is the court issues these orders as in the Texas abortion case where there's very little discussion or analysis sometimes the you know, person writing that order is not identified. And it does not feel as though the same thorough uh, analysis is necessarily revealed by the court. Uh, why are they drawing the conclusions they are? And yet it has a sub significant impact. It can effectively uh, uh, end the case 
uh, in reality in a number of cases, and it has done that. So that's the problem with the shadow docket. And then the last thing I'll say is proposals for reform. As uh, you all may know, uh, President Biden established a commission back in May to study calls for reform of the Supreme Court. And that commission is a 36 member bipartisan commission. It's got a lot of law faculty on it. It's got uh, other experts and scholars on it. And um, it is set to issue a report by the end of the calendar year. Currently, it is still holding public meetings and is receiving public comments. And if anyone's interested in commenting, I can send the link actually to Sally to blast out to people. Comments uh, are being taken by the commission through November 15. And their meetings, their public meetings, I think are also available to join by Zoom if you want to listen in. They've been taking testimony from various parties and so on. The main reform proposal that I've seen that has bipartisan support is an 18 year fixed term, non-renewable. And to make that staggered so that every president would have probably two Supreme Court appointments. And the idea behind it is to eliminate the gamesmanship around retirements. I mean, I'm sure you're seeing the news about uh, Stephen Breyer, he's getting pressured to retire before the midterms so that a Democratic president can appoint a successor with a, a Democratic Senate uh, control, although it's a very razor thing control, um, and so on. There are other suggestions for reform. One of them, and I'll leave on this note because Sally's there, she's reminding me of time, is, um, uh, is the notion that Congress might limit the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. Article three, which sets up the Supreme Court, says basically that except for a few types of cases where you go to the Supreme Court first, that's where the case originates. Like the case on the docket this uh, term involving Mississippi and Tennessee fighting over groundwater access, okay, who owns the groundwater. That case starts in the Supreme Court. Otherwise, the Supreme Court is an appellate court and the constitution says it has appellate jurisdiction to decide issues of fact and law basically with such limitations and regulations as Congress imposes. And over the years, at various times when people have been upset with the Supreme Court, like when it ruled that uh, uh, banning flag burning was a violation of the First Amendment, for example, or prayer in public schools, um, people have proposed statutes that would limit the court's jurisdiction over those types of issues, or abortion, for example, and so on. They've never gotten anywhere um, but that provision is in the Constitution, and some of the reform proposals center around that. And then, of course, there's the idea of expanding the uh, number of justices on the court, but uh, I very much doubt that's going anywhere. So um, I'll leave it there. I am happy to uh, answer questions. I'm happy to stay and answer questions uh, since it's 1259. Um, so thank you very much. <laughs> I'm going to ask if there are any questions on um, Zoom, and then um, we'll take one of those, and then Beth has offered to stay afterwards for those of us here in, in the Frangipani. Any Zoom questions? You can go. No? No. Nope. All right, then. Stunned into silence. Stunned into silence. That was a lot of information. Like my students, I know. <laughs> All right, sure. Um, Beth, thank you so much. In honor of your presentation, we'll make a, a gift to Pantry 279. In wow, thank you very much. And I'm very happy to contribute to that. So. Oh, thank you very yes. much. All right, then. Absolutely. Um, so I have one quick question for everybody because we're on a countdown. How many weeks until we honor Charlotte Zitlow? Good job at the Rotary Toast. We'd really like to have 100% participation from our club. There's never been a Rotarian who's been an honoree at the Rotary Toast. And she's from our club. So 100% and you can do it. You can attend online or you can be there in person, rotarytoast.com. Okay, let's close the meeting by reciting the four-way test mm -hmm. plus one. Mm -hmm. Of the things we think, say, or do, First, is it the truth? truth. Second, Sorry. is it fair to fair. all concerned? Third, will it build goodwill and better friendships? And fourth, it will it be beneficial to all concerned? And fifth, is it fun? <laughs> Thank you.